So we spend one week uh, of classes uh, with a rigorous um, uh, training in, in Austrian economics. The particularity of uh, this Mises Institute Summer University as compared to similar instructional conferences both in the US and in other countries of the world is the, the systematic approach. Right? That's something that we pointed out at the beginning of the week to you and that you have experienced. Meanwhile, namely that we, we follow by and large the, the, the model of a praxeological treaty. So we start with the fundamentals first, and then we get to ever more uh, concrete uh, subjects. So you had two weeks of uh, general classes, a short introduction to, to the basics, and then you could uh, choose your electives. You had a crash course in Austrian economics. And this is uh, different from what you get at most other conferences. And I don't say that the quality of the lectures at these other conferences is worse, but um, in certain cases might be better. But what you don't get is the systematic, coherent approach. And as a consequence, it's much more eclectic. Right? So it's like uh, if, you, if you join uh, hands with uh, uh, little fellow bees and you're flying over the prairie and you're sniffing at each flower a little bit. That's something what you get in these other things. <laughs> Whereas here you get the, uh, the rigorous uh, approach, you, know, you get really the, the brainwashing. <laughs> so at least you come up clear after the week. Uh, clean, clean, right? Um, well, uh, of course, this, this is uh, unfortunately so not a, a, a Soviet gulag. So you had lots of other influences during the week, and our point is not at all, well, to brainwash you, but to give you, provide you with a coherent whole. So why did we make this effort? Why did you make this effort? And I think one point that is uh, certainly, that needs to be said here is that we agree on the importance of ideas for changing the world. Uh, ideas are, of course, important for each one of us individually, and you can live a life of ideas, just learning about ideas, thinking about ideas, about theories and so on, uh, as some uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, consumption, a life of a, a consumer's life, uh, because ideas are, are beautiful or can be beautiful, so that's a way to, to approach them. But another way of seeing ideas is uh, as a means to attain, a certain, to, to attain certain ends. One, the important, uh, most important end that we pursue as far as members of society, is to uh, change the world for the better, change society for the better. In order to do this, we need to know something about means and ends, which is, of course, at the center of praxeology. And in each human action, the person in question employs means to attain the end. So he's always acting rational in the Misesian sense. By the way, this was an exam question, right? and some answered wrong. <laughs> and so the, the correct definition of rationality, uh, Misesian rationality, is to uh, use means to attain ends, irrespective of whether these are the correct means to uh, attain the ends. So you're not only, human beings are always rational, they're not only rational if they choose the right means to attain their ends. Right? We always have the, the structure of our mind uh, that we are geared toward ends, we are using means. Sometimes we are dead wrong about the, the means that are fit to attain our ends, and that's what we need, why we need instruction, that's why we need education, that's why we need reflection and uh, experiment. But uh, science not only, only enlightens about us about the relationships between means and ends, it also enlightens us about the possible ends that we can strive for, the ends that we should strive for. Uh, not all ends are attainable to us. Uh, some people, of course, making plans for the conquest of the Mars and, and, and other things, and that's not an impossible end, but um, uh, other ends are, impos are impossible, making all mankind completely equal, cloning mankind and so on. This is an impossible end. Uh, making all human beings virtuous is prob probably an impossible end. Uh, making all human beings equally intelligent is an impossible end. Uh, making uh, the, the life, uh, the world, uh, fit for complete disappearance of, of crime, uh, of, of bad behavior, and so on, is also an impossible end. That's not something that we can reasonably strive for, but that's something that we've got to learn. In order to change the world, in order to change uh, society, well, we need especially to change politics. Ideas are not only important because they enlighten us about the, the means that are fit to attain our ends, 
But ideas are important because they do steer the actions of every one of us. So even if we pursue, if we adhere to wrong ideas, right, that's, uh, that's a point that has been stressed by uh, social philosophers as from the 16th century, uh, that ultimately all government and therefore all society, uh, the operation of society is based on ideas. Uh, people uh, consent to government in the sense that they do not oppose it uh, because they believe that uh, this government is legitimate. They consent to policies, not necessarily in the sense that they have nothing against it, but in the sense that they do not oppose them, um, uh, because they believe that uh, these policies are either fit to attain the end or that those who apply the politi uh, policies are legitimate in doing so. So politics is always based on consent in this basic sense. And that's something that we have learned from uh, Etienne de la Boétie, who is a French philosopher of the 16th century, David Hume, a Scottish philosopher of the 18th century. And uh, this basic insight made its way also to Austria. And we find it in the writings of uh, Friedrich von Wieser, uh, who was very much uh, interested in the relationships uh, between uh, uh, leaders, social leaders, political leaders, uh, and, and the other members of society. And also in the writings of Mises, who uh, was, a, was a student of, of Wieser's, and of uh, uh, Josef Schumpeter, also a student of Wieser's, and in the theory of the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is the the trailblazer, he is, a, he is a, a, a leader, but he can go his way only to the extent that uh, society uh, tolerates what he is doing. And one uh, reason why, uh, or the, the essential reason why it came to the Industrial Revolution at the onset of the 19th century uh, was not a technological advance. Right? The, the steam uh, engine was known by the Romans and even by the Greeks. Uh, it had been known for, for th hundreds and thousands of years, but it was never put into practice because it jeopardized uh, a social system uh, based on slavery. Right? So if you put the steam engine into practice, all kinds of jobs disappear, therefore all kinds of, of products also, and uh, this would threaten the established uh, entrepreneurs, the established producers. So it was not tolerated. It was ideas that, that prevented their applications. Only at the beginning of the 19th century were conditions ripe, or at the end of the 18th century were conditions ripe for the application of this because people then tolerated that people be fired and that uh, traditional producers go bankrupt because of the introduction of the new technology. That's the main thing that changed. And it changed because people had gained insights about the social effects of competition uh, and of what Schumpeter later called the process of creative destruction. As if introduction of uh, certain new technologies, that's the creation part, and this uh, prevents the uh, profitability of more established ways of, uh, of production, that's the destruction part. And this destruction is socially beneficial. Right? It's not nice for the, from the point of view of the persons who are concerned, because they lose their job, they lose their income, uh, they are forced to work at uh, inferior conditions elsewhere, they have to move to a place that is not quite as nice as California, or Auburn, Alabama, and uh, they have to accept lower wage rates or lower profits and whatever. Right? So it's not nice for them personally, but from the point of view of the aggregate, it's essential because they are being forced into these other uh, ventures, uh, creates additional product that was not, be, was not available before and would not become available otherwise, otherwise than by this process of creative destruction. Okay, so we need ideas and we need to spread ideas. But the application of ideas uh, requires more. It requires also uh, a virtuous life in the course of which we apply the right ideas in practice. And uh, those who tolerated losing their jobs and tolerated that others lost their jobs as a consequence of technological innovation in the beginning of the 19th century uh, acted virtuously. And they uh, had in mind the, uh, the flourishing of um, all human beings, of society as a whole, of all individuals, not only of themselves or of their immediate neighbors, of their friends and families and so on, but they were looking at the, at the larger picture. And that's exactly what we do in economics. So ideas help you to, to lead a virtuous life, not to be too uh, focused on 
uh, the, 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 your immediate concern, um, but to have a, a larger view on man and on society as a whole. So in order to, uh, uh, and, and this leads us uh, to Mises because Mises did precisely this. And he led a virtuous life. If we are talking about the uh, virtues, uh, then uh, well, there are different ways to classify them. I always prefer the, the classical cardinal virtues, right? So that we find from uh, medieval times onwards and the scholastic uh, uh, literature. So what are the cardinal uh, virtues? There are uh, prudence, uh, justice, strength, and temperance. So I'll come to talk about them uh, when we get to, to Mises. But before we, we get there, I would first like to, to point out, uh, briefly summarize the challenges that we face today. So the obstacles that we need to overcome uh, to, uh, to make uh, this world a better place. And uh, also talk briefly about uh, a dead end in confronting these challenges. And the dead end is to conceive of the problem that we face as a purely technological problem or as a purely technical problem that wouldn't require uh, any moral aspect or wouldn't involve any moral aspect. So what are the challenges uh, that we face? Well, first of all, uh, this, from a political point of view, it's the most immediate one. We are living in an age of globalization. Globalization, uh, this is, uh, well, of course, that is well known, but globalization have, has two aspects. There's, on the one hand, economic globalization, and there is political globalization. And economic globalization uh, consists in the integration of the world economy um, based on uh, exchange and other forms of voluntary interaction. And globalization in that respect is not any different from uh, the uh, integration that we had before in previous times that occurred on a, on a national scale. And so now we have uh, the division of labor on a global scale before we had a move from, uh, uh, let's say, a local or regional scale to a national scale. Right? This occurred, roughly speaking, in the, in the 18th and 19th century. And right? this was uh, or maybe also in the 17th century. This was a move before you had uh, 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 an economic structure of such a sort that companies were operating only on a, on a regional level. There were very few inter international companies. And so the, all the markets grew closer together. And the reason why they grew closer together is that people became ever richer. And, uh, it was a progress or some growth rates and so on. And to the extent that you grow richer, you can uh, entertain and, and create relationships with people that are living at places that are more removed from your own place. And so you can create uh, means of, uh, of transport um, and uh, new markets. That's happening now on a global scale. It's nothing new in that respect. On the other hand, there's political uh, integration. And in a way, also political integration is also nothing new because we always had a political uh, integration also on the national level. And it usually follows political integration. And so as people come closer together, uh, working with people that formerly to belong to other political entities, then there is now a problem for the governments that are concerned because they can no longer completely control the flow of people and of goods and services. Okay? So that's uh, known as the problem of international uh, economic relations. Okay? Uh, in former times, if uh, local princes were taxing their subjects too heavily, they would emigrate to the next uh, princedom and so on. Today we have the same thing. If the United States increases its tax rates too much, then people have an incentive to go to uh, Liechtenstein and uh, Switzerland and other nice places. And uh, the response to this, the political response to this, is not different today than it, what, uh, than it had been in previous ages, namely that governments now try to get together. So they form either a cartel, or if they do not find voluntary cooperation from the side of the other governments, they strive uh, simply to conquer them. Okay, Take the stick out, uh, knock them on the head, and create a larger political entity. So political integration always follows economic integration. It's a, res it's a political response to the problems of international uh, interventionism on a national level. Right? If you intervene too much or you intervene at all, you create 
uh, the phenomenon called evasion, you increase in taxes so people are leaving your country, you are creating regulations so people are also leaving your place or hiding the money, going to the black market and so on. And uh, if they can go elsewhere, well, you have a problem. As long as they are forced to remain on your own territory, you can control them. If they can go elsewhere, you, you have a problem. And so you have a problem of international economic and political relations. And the policy response to this is then cooperation, cartelization, or if necessary, uh, war and conquest. So from the Austrian point of view, of course, economic inter integration is the integration of civilized people, or more precisely, it's the integration of uh, human beings to the extent that they are civilized people, and right? to the extent that they interact on the basis of exchange and so on. Whereas political integration is the integration of barbari barbarians and savages. And again, more precisely, to the extent that human beings are barbarians and savages. And because you have members of, of, of a government and so on who do not behave consistently as, as savages, but to some extent, to this extent, they are pursuing political action. So that's one challenge that we face. So we need to find answers to this. And Austrians do have, a, do have answers uh, uh, to the problems raised by uh, globalization. And the most important element of this is already to distinguish between these two forms of globalization, political uh, globalization and economic uh, globalization. And to see that the, the problems that we here confront as a, as a rule result from government interventionism. Next, we have uh, the mayhem, the present mayhem on the financial markets that is now spreading out to the economy. It's another big challenge. And uh, uh, so these problems started in July of 2007, now two years further, further on. And uh, uh, happily, uh, things have uh, turned out uh, in a rather positive way, um, the, uh, so the challenge has been successfully met because, uh, as, as we all know, Austrian ideas have uh, obtained much more of a hearing, especially in the, uh, in the past 12 months, than they had have ever before. Right? So this is a successful challenge, and it, it is um, very uh, instructive to, to see the reasons for this uh, success. The reasons are that Austrians did have a coherent answer. They didn't have to make up their answers uh, ad hoc uh, as, a, as an, uh, a new creation of some idea, but it was a coherent uh, theoretical uh, system that they could offer to explain what was going on on the market. And there were institutions of learning already in place, such as the Mises Institute and, and other similar institutions, uh, which spread the Austrian message. So, we have been very successful so far. We still need to be uh, more, even more successful in the next future uh, because uh, uh, governments, of course, will continue their way of, of solving the problems, that is, by increased interventionism, which is likely to entail um, ever more problems, as we know here in this room, but as not enough people know outside of this room. So that's the challenge that we face, is essentially to get the message out. A third challenge uh, that we face is the collapse, uh, respectively the transformation of higher education. Um, many of you are not yet experienced enough to see the problem because you have spent a few years in school and a few years in college, uh, so you don't see necessarily the evolution uh, that college and, and school has taken over the course of the, uh, the past 25 years, which is my experience span or the past 50 years as is the experience span of some of us uh, th that are in this room. But what we clearly see is, is the decadence and the uh, decline of uh, the traditional institutions of higher learning, uh, which is due essentially to the fact that they are run by governments and therefore not only pursue the objective of uh, learning, but mix this objective with various other objectives, such as enlightening people about the glories uh, of, of the government and glories of interventionism, um, uh, getting uh, more people, uh, as much people as possible, into these institutions, uh, creating uh, diploma mills, uh, etc. So this is taking place, and uh, the market is already reacting to this as a, as a response 
to this decline, new institutions are springing in. Uh, and one of, uh, of these new institutions is, for example, the Mises Institute. And you have privately run uh, institutions that uh, step in the gaps left open by uh, the decline of the, of the traditional institutions. And we are right now in the middle, or at the, probably only at the beginning of this process, which is very similar to the process of currency substitution when you have one currency in very strong inflation or even in hyperinflation and people are starting to use other currencies just to protect themselves. So uh, in a similar matter, manner, in, as far as education is concerned, with the traditional institutions in decline, people are starting to homeschool their children. That's been going on uh, for quite a while now, but it's, it's accelerating. And there are institutions such as the Mises Institute that are springing up and providing not yet uh, uh, diplomas, right, because we uh, are handicapped by, by regulations, particularly the accreditation system. Uh, but at least you can get something like an education that you would not necessarily get <laughs> at other places, <clears throat> which is already something. And the last uh, challenge I would, uh, there, there are more, but one that I should like to uh, mention at least is the, the destruction of the family through the welfare state, which of course has implications both for uh, education uh, and also for uh, the, <coughs> the functioning of the economy. Uh, the family is under uh, attack from the welfare state because it's the traditional, um, let's say, from an economic point of view, the family is a, is a is a producer of human beings, right? a producer not of meat, which, which would be different, right? It would be just churn out babies and so on, just uh, let them and then feed them or, or whatever. This is uh, this is not the production of, of a person. Right? That's probably the most adequate way to define a, the family: it's a, a producing unit of persons, not just men and right? human beings, but persons, people who are. Uh, adjusted to the world, who are uh, intellectually adjusted to the world, but also morally adjusted to live their lives in the world and to live with other people. Um, and the, the way the family has produced persons traditionally is uh, uh, by, by stressing, uh, let's say, traditional moral precepts. And that's the only way, by the way, you can run a family. Uh, just to mention a few things. You cannot uh, run a family on the basis that all members of the family are somehow equal. Okay, so the two-year-old has the same say in the arrangement of the of whatever the dinner or the family vacation or uh, the selection of the, the place where the family lives, etc. As the parents, and if you do this, well, I, you might you might try it out, so. <laughs> but you will very quickly come to the conclusion that that's not a good idea. Right? So there's always this hierarchical uh, element there. There's uh, the, the element of love, which, are, uh, which a family cannot be run. And if uh, you have um, uh, gender warfare within the family or age warfare within the family, right? The young generation against the old and each one trying to get advantage and so on. Well, this will not uh, last for a very long time. Uh, so the family produces and reproduces traditional moral values. Values, and that's the the reason, uh, one one of the main reasons why it has come under attack from the welfare state, from the side of the welfare state, who wishes to impose on society a different set of values. Uh, and again, uh, one thing that is very big in, in Europe right now is is gender mainstreaming. Uh, so, uh, children from the age from from kindergarten on board need to be enlightened about the fact that there is no really any difference between males and females, some slight uh, centimeters of, of difference <laughs> in certain places of the human body, but otherwise it's really by and the same, and we all think the same way and feel the same way, uh, etc. Right? And uh, of course, this is something that, that runs counter to the most daily experience. Yesterday we had the, the panel discussion and somebody said, well, uh, very young children, they cannot yet distinguish between mine and thine. Uh, and again, that, that, that's not true. Uh, I've never given a lecture to my two-year-old on, on property rights theory or something, right? I just need to observe them play with, with other children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine, yeah. Keep him out and whatever, right? So 
this is, it's, it's the most, um, most primitive, most, most basic uh, properties, some of the most basic and primitive elements of, of human existence. It springs into place uh, spontaneously. And very young children learn spontaneously, well, that girls are somehow different. Once, once they get to the age of six or eight or something, they just hate one another. Or they want, well, hate is maybe exactly, but they don't want to have anything to do, or they're just crazy, or these completely different beings over there. And then once they get 12, 13, 14, then things start being interesting again. <laughs> need to control this. But things start being interesting again precisely because they realize they're not the same, right? So, and uh, so all this uh, comes under frontal attack just because it doesn't fit the ideological preconceptions of, um, of uh, our enlightened rulers or those who want to be our enlightened rulers. And for some of them, they don't have even a very strong personal stake in this. For, them, for some of them, it's just a means of gaining more power. Right? There, there are people who are running the administrations charged with enforcing gender mainstreaming and they don't have a personal strong stake in this, but it's just, okay, we will do this. We get new stuff, new st staff, right? So new people to be hired with a higher uh, salaries, a promotion of the new bureaucratic ladder and so on. That's why they do it. So these are, uh, these are main challenges. And of course, ultimately we can uh, confront these challenges only um, with the help of, of ideas and enlightening people, but also by uh, living a virtuous life, but acting as as models. Uh, a purely uh, technical or technological conception of these problems is uh, inappropriate. So that's my next point. Technology is not a solution to these uh, challenges. I'll give you um, one or two examples. Uh, in our day, uh, many people, in particular many libertarians, uh, believe that uh, the internet has given us a means to save the world through purely technological, a purely technological approach. We don't need to convince anybody. We just need to have the internet that permits us to circumvent the, the government, evade taxes, create new monies, uh, uh, create new communities, uh, and so on. And we, uh, we would be, uh, this way, could uh, evade government interventionism. Now, uh, clearly this is not true, right? The internet was not the solution as a matter of fact, and it's not easy, it's not difficult to see why this is so. As I said this morning uh, in, my in my lecture, the, the basic problem that you have, for example, in the case of, of currency uh, uh, production, if you want to produce a new money, uh, purely electronic money, the basic problem that, ha that you have is that you need to have a server somewhere, okay? And if your service necessarily stands on some territory co controlled by some government, so forget about the idea that you can just, by purely uh, in the ether existence, can avoid government interventionism. That's just not possible. Uh, same thing, for, of course, there are communities, discussion groups, and so on that can be led in the, in the internet, but um, that's like, let's say, comparable to a guerrilla organization and military that hangs around in the trees of the, uh, in, in, up in the trees in, in, in the jungle somewhere and you know, occupying this ground. And the army is standing in the cities and on the fields and so on, occupying anything that is, that is somehow worthwhile, right? You, ultimately, the war must be won on the ground and not in the jungle and in, in the recesses where uh, uh, social life doesn't play any role. Uh, Similar beliefs have plagued, in particular, libertarians, socialists also to some extent, but libertarians in particular for, for many years. Another example from the 19th century was the belief of Herbert Spencer and others that uh, it was just a question of uh, automatic evolution of society, that government would play an ever smaller role, and the market, so voluntary corporation, would just take over. Uh, Spencer didn't el much elaborate on this, but clearly it was based on the uh, his insight that the market is more productive than government interventionism, okay, but it doesn't follow from this uh, that the government uh, recedes, right? Because the benefits that the market creates, as we know, are of an aggregate nature. They do not necessarily concern all individuals and not necessarily concern all individuals equally. So government intervention, while it impoverishes society as a whole, at least in the short run, brings benefits for some at the expense of others. So there are very strong incentives 
for, for the maintenance of governance, at, uh, at least from the point of view of uh, the members of government and their, their allies in the business world, and that's why governments have not uh, disappeared. Right? There was this very narrow um, uh, window, let's say, of uh, social evolution, roughly from the 1840s to the 1870s, when there was in all European countries, indeed, a tendency for uh, governments to regress and uh, to have uh, greater liberty, liberties for individuals, for the citizens. But this came to an end starting from the 1870s. Uh, it is clear that, that technology, be it technology of social organization, organization of firms, organization of societies, internet, etc., uh, can uh, bring um, great benefits, but it can also bring unheard of, yet unheard of forms of control. And the internet, again, is a case in point. Right? So the internet certainly has great, created greater liberties, is, uh, has uh, dramatically reduced the costs of networking for people, uh, uh, individuals, who before had to go through institutions uh, created or controlled by the government. But on the other hand, um, the same internet also allows the government, if it uh, can manage to control those new intermediaries, because the internet is an intermediary, just like money, if it can control this new intermediary, it can just as well um, uh, control, again, individuals, and this in an unheard form, unheard of form. So, again, the bottom line is that there is no easy technical way out. One has to confront the main issues at hand. One has to meet the government um, on its own ground. And we cannot just recede. We need to uh, confront uh, the issues, and especially we need to convince everybody else. One can convince everybody else with ideas, by the correctness of ideas. Okay, that's, that's one way. And as far as intellectuals is concerned, that is often the most interesting or most appealing way. But as far as the large mass of uh, society is concerned, that's certainly not the only way, and probably not the most efficient way. Very few people, finally, are able to um, follow a praxeological demonstration, okay? Uh, even the concept of scarcity requires some sort of uh, ability of abstraction that is, as we see in daily practice, not given to everybody. And I see it in the case of many of my students, right? <laughs> especially first-year students, uh, and, and even more so if we go into politics, right? There, there, there are people who are constitutionally, intellectually unable to understand what this is, scarcity. They just do not get it. <laughs> and you can tell them, then they you say, ah, yeah, scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. Then we should create a world without scarcity. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, so then they go on explaining, yeah, in this new world, and then we will do this and this and that. So it's just this preconception. This is pure fantasy, of course. Right? It's just uh, uh, hot air. Uh, but the point is that they don't understand what they're talking about. So... Ideas uh, are of crucial importance because ideas are decisive in convincing, converting uh, the intellectual elites of, of society. Uh, you, for example. Right? So I count you in this. Okay, well, in your case, we'll make an exception. <laughs> right? And in the long run, this is, of course, of crucial importance. But the elites will not be able to convince the rest of the population by argument alone. They also need to be virtuous in the way they lead their lives. And that's the, the other main way, the other main mechanism, how you convince people, namely by living what you are preaching, drinking the water that you are preaching, right? not preaching water and drinking wine, as the saying goes, right? And in that respect, especially, we can, uh, uh, we can learn from, from Mises, because he did walk his talk. It was not just uh, hot air. He did what he was, what he was saying, and this certainly, uh, about as much as uh, what he was writing, impressed those who immediately know him. Of course, he had on us, he had his main influence through his write, writings. Uh, but uh, there too, right? I mean, the, the question that we have, uh, would have to ask ourselves, is uh, how would we feel about his writings, let's say, if, if Mises had been, uh, whatever, the Ministry of the Economy of Austria and yet lavishly subsidized his friends 
and then various other things. And then on the other hand, he goes on with perfectly logically correct arguments to praise the competitive process of the market. Right? Would have been somehow fishy. And uh, many people would not go into more detail reading him. So it's even as far as the purely intellectual level is concerned, it was important that Mises walked his talk. Uh, so my point here is not that we should replicate uh, Mises' life, right? Should not all try to become immigrants, right? And uh, uh, spend some time in Switzerland, then eventually move to New York City, live some dire years, then eventually become visiting professors for the next 24 or something. And so that's not the point. The point is not to replicate another person's life, but to be inspired by the, the principles that inspired this life and to apply it uh, to our own uh, circumstances in the most fitting way, uh, considering our own strengths and our own personal weaknesses. So let's go, let, how can we, in how far was Mises virtuous? Just a, a few points. So again, I'll take uh, the list of the traditional cardinal virtues, temperance, strength, justice, uh, prudence. Temperance is the virtue of uh, a well-ordered life, okay, which concerns the individual level, but also can be applied on a more macro level as far as society is concerned. On a micro level, it, uh, it uh, concerns the uh, uh, harmonious ordering of your different uh, strengths of uh, uh, activities, where there's such basic things, uh, banal things like getting enough sleep, right? You cannot live a virtuous life if you're just ne uh, neglecting the fact that you have a body right, that needs to be fed, needs to uh, get rest, and so on. So you need to do these things. Some of you have neglected this during this week. <laughs> right? It concerns uh, the balancing of um, uh, one's vocation and one's profession, right? We had a very good talk here uh, during this week by Gary North on, on the subject. Uh, and there is, a, there is a vocation. In the, in the ideal case, you can turn your vocation into a profession. But this is, uh, to be honest, very, very exceptional. Uh, I don't know of a single person right now of my personal acquaintance who does it. So you always have this trade-off. And if there is a trade-off to be made, immediately the virtue of temperance comes into play. How much do you pursue your, your vocation? How much do you pursue your, um, your profession? There is a balance to be, to be made. This balance needs to be made for each person differently, but it is a balance to be made. We cannot just pursue the one at the neglect of everything else. We need to balance vocation and both vocation and balance with family life, with uh, interaction with friends and so on. If we specialize in praxeology and economics, um, we, we need to balance our, uh, our interests. And you cannot become a good economist, as Mises said, if you study only uh, wheat prices in 19th century England. Okay, that will not make you into a good economist. So you need to gain uh, knowledge and even in-depth knowledge about economics as a whole, all the while specializing in one area in particular where you will gain your reputation and as a as a scholar. Right? So again, this is a matter of temperance, and again, so this 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 balance to be struck. And Mises did this. And he had uh, he he made his choices, and as we know well, for example, he renounced for for many years to uh, to family life. And he didn't marry, uh, professional life, and and uh, so it was his vocation and his profession, and by and large, that was it. But even Mises eventually got married, and it is uh, very significant that he did. A few uh, human beings are actually uh, made to be monks or uh, nuns. Okay, some are, and even they, monks and nuns, they live together. Uh, very few of them are hermites, uh, living in the various holes or, or mountains <laughs> or treetops or wherever. <laughs> right, so there is the, this, this balance to be made too, and of course all of this requires time to be invested. Mises certainly excelled as far as the virtue of strength is concerned. Right? The virtue of strength... Uh, gets us over all kinds of difficulties in life. It's, it's the premier virtue of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs have to face all kinds of adversities. There's resistance, uh, employees complaining, uh, change things, uh, competitors are complaining, so they're starting to get the government against you and so on. Uh, you're acting especially always against the uncertainty of the market. You don't know how, how much your damn customers will buy in the future. Uh, and you, nevertheless, you have to make your decisions right now to prepare for these future contingencies and so on. 
So all these are adversities, adversities that you need strength uh, to overcome, strength and good judgment. And uh, Mises see, uh, certainly had this uh, as, uh, to, to an extraordinary uh, uh, extent. Uh, by the way, he, wa he was born on uh, September 29th. It's the feast day of um, uh, St. Michael the Archangel, uh, the patron of strength. So it might have something to do with this. Uh, Mises overcome, overcame this resistance not only at a professional level as far as the Chamber of Commerce is concerned. He survived uh, two wars, the first one with uh, several months of, uh, uh, on the front, as I mentioned uh, last Sunday. Uh, he had uh, many enemies uh, throughout his professional career in, in Austria. Then his uh, uh, German enemies almost uh, caught him when he fled from, from Switzerland to the United States. In the US, he first had to operate under very um, uh, miserable material conditions, uh, and which was all the harder for him because he was used to uh, convenient uh, circumstances, material circumstances. So he overcame all of this, and he never uh, 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 let go, he never let, uh, let loose uh, the, the pursuit of his main objective, which was the development of economic science and uh, combating uh, the champions of interventionism, however miserable he was personally, never let go. Uh, the prudence, uh, the, the uh, virtue of justice um, was too, is, is very strongly uh, related to, to temperance, something to do with balance. Just as you give to everybody, to other people, what is their due, and this giving to other people, of course, concerns uh, not violating uh, property rights. And so libertarians certainly stress the, the virtue of justice, and, and Mises did also uh, stress precisely this point. He was the foremost champion of property rights, so he was a champion of justice, uh, the most uh, central uh, element of, of justice. But he was also he also excelled in, in, in virtue as far as in this virtue as far as uh, his moral obligation to other people were concerned. Now I know that there are many libertarians who think there is no such thing as a moral obligation. No such thing as a moral debt. That's another issue. Right? So I would just tell you what he did, and well, you can classify this as, as a moral virtue or not. What he did was to help out people who were somehow close to him when they had difficulties, especially material difficulties. So he got lots of people uh, uh, whom he knew from friends or family and so on. He got them a job, uh, spent money or, or donated money to various uh, charitable organizations and so on. He did all of this. I wouldn't say as compared to the uh, to his strength, it was, he was not probably not extraordinary here, but he still had this virtue. He would not have had as much impact on on other people without having had this virtue. But of course, Mises, uh, apart from his strength, most excelled as far as the justice of prudence is concerned. So this is what we need to focus on, on most. Um, prudence is the the virtue of. Um, uh, of knowing things in their context, okay? Prudence, uh, the word prudence, both in the English language and uh, other languages, uh, is uh, sometimes today used in the, in the uh, sense of taking care of, uh, be careful, don't overdo it, uh, don't say a nasty word, or don't act too audaciously, uh, pursuing this and that project, so be prudent, um, he's a prudent driver, and uh, so on. Uh, but what it means in the traditional uh, uh, theory of the, of the virtues, it means that you uh, excel in knowing uh, things as they are, and especially in their context with other things. So you don't have a limited vision of things as they are, but see them in their context. And that's, of course, a virtue that you, well, I, I think as an economist, you need quite a, a, a doses of this, otherwise you cannot be a good economist, because you, you cannot be, as we have already said, just be a specialist of some narrow uh, area. So Mises had this, and he, uh, um, uh, he uh, from the outset, he was uh, using this uh, uh, this ability, and was willing to use this ability quite consciously, in order to make the world a better place, in order to change uh, society. Even in, in the days when he was still an interventionist, also in his early days, that was his aim, use this, this knowledge that he would gain to improve the world. And then he saw precisely that interventionism would not 
help to improve the world. It's another interrelationship between um, morals and, um, and mere technological knowledge, uh, something that we also discussed this week. Uh, praxeology and economics enlighten us about causal relationships as they are, but then, of course, you're free to use them as you see fit. If you want to ruin your economy, you raise taxes. Uh, if you hate your fellow human beings, well, you uh, regulate them to death and uh, impose uh, gender mainstreaming and other nice things. <laughs> um, so again, so in order to, to improve the world, we not only need to have knowledge, we need to also de have the will to do good. Then Mises' uh, second point, as far as this prudence, uh, virtue of prudence is concerned, he was, uh, he excelled in, uh, as, as a critical mind. Critical not only of the theories of others that he didn't like, but as his transition from, his personal transition from interventionism to uh, free market economics uh, shows, he was critical of his own uh, preconceived notion. So, with Ayn Rand, uh, we might say, check your premises, okay? <laughs> check your, always check your premises. That's certainly what Mises did. He checked his premises as far as economics is concerned, right? Uh, changes his view about the impact of government policy here, uh, changed his views on money. Uh, when he published the theory of money and credit, for example, right, it, it was not his last word on money. He constantly kept thinking about the, these issues uh, later and changed his views uh, on them. For those of you who want to have an introduction on this, there's a good article that's been published by um, Nikolai Gurchev in the 2004 Journal of Libertarian Studies. Right? I think number three or so. And the article is on um, uh, Mises on money, how Mises changed his opinion on various, sometimes uh, important uh, questions as far as monetary economics is concerned, between the theory of money and credit in 1912 and human action in 1949. Right? So Mises constantly did this, and um, as, a, as a good e economist, as a good scientist in general, that's what you need to do uh, constantly, uh, check your own premises. Checking his own premises also led him to a new epistemology. Right? Certainly didn't start off with the notion, well, uh, <laughs> economics is an a priori science, I don't have to study uh, 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 things empirically, don't have to conduct field studies and so on. It was precisely the other way around. He studied as a field study officer for the Chamber of Commerce. Right? So he went to the different industries, collected the data and so on. Uh, writing reports, uh, not stressing that much economic arguments, but essentially all this uh, stati statistical material. Right? So, I mean, his entire upbringing would have um, qualified him uh, for becoming a thorough and adamant uh, empiricist. And he checked his premises. And he saw, well, what, it, what is my argument ultimately based on? Is it based on something that I do observe, or is it based on something that I only know about through reflection? And he came to the latter conclusion, so he said it. And he didn't say it just because it was uh, original, right? because it made him stand out. He was not the first one to make such a claim, but he made this claim um, after a thorough uh, check, uh, premise check, uh, of the things that he knew something about. Mises also checked his premises as far as the organization and transmission of science is con concerned. So he was raised in one of the great uh, universities of uh, continental Europe. The University of Vienna was one of the top places of learning. And Mises later in his life saw that the universities were actually doing more harm than good because they were infected with a virus of, of statism, uh, which has uh, affected first uh, well, the, the politically sensible uh, disciplines, such as law, but then also economics, and they were spreading out over to, uh, to other fields. I mean, in our day, this is much, even much clearer than in, uh, in Mises' day, right? because we have disciplines such as climatology and uh, earth research and, and life, life science and uh, similar things that uh, are strongly affected, uh, infected with a political agenda. Right? So, because they deliver pretext for government interventionism. Another uh, field that is relatively new is business ethics. Right? Business ethics is, a, is, a, is an entire discipline that is based on the premise that there's <coughs> something deeply morally wrong with business. So you need to repair business. The only question is how you do this. Right? So, um, and of course, this ultimately results from the fact that uh, higher learning is not a competitive industry. 
It is a monopolized, cartelized uh, status industry. So the premise is built into the very organizational principle of this industry. So what's, uh, what's the implication of this? Once you have found this out, once you've checked your premises, well, you, you, start putting, you stop putting all your hope in uh, making the universities a better place. You uh, put your energies into making them more competitive, creating competition between different universities. And you start addressing uh, those people who you want to reach ultimately you, to address them directly. That's what, what Mises then started doing. He started uh, writing popular articles and explaining uh, economics to a, to a larger audience, not only to an audience of specialists. And that's also something that uh, the, the Mises Institute is, is very good at. I mean, boiling down economic arguments in the form of daily articles and, and other literary output that is accessible to, uh, to citizens, not only to, to specialists. Uh, third thing that we can learn from Mises as far as prudence is concerned, uh, uh, Mises spoke up. Uh, so he, uh, of course, an emanation of, of, uh, of his strength, and uh, uh, he said things that had to be, had to be said. He did not give in to evil. That's uh, his, his lifelong motto, and also the motto of the Mises Institute, did not give in to evil, evil uh, with the uh, particularity that he did not attack um, his individual, his opponents personally. Right? So even if he knew that uh, opponents um, were invoking wrong arguments to justify a policy that would benefit them personally, Mises only attacked them on the first ground. So he did not say, well, this guy is wrong because he holds that from A follows B, whereas from A follow, follows C. And on top of that, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, a gangster uh, because he's tr just trying to enrich himself. So he left the, the gangster story out. I said, well, if I do both, then people will think that I have a personal feud against the person in question. I will focus only on the ideas. And now, again, uh, that was his um, personal uh, way of, of, of moderation, moderating his argument. Other Austrians have not followed in his, in his footsteps here. Murray Rothbard, for example, uh, never left out an occasion to make both claims. Right? It's wrong, and this guy is a gangster. <laughs> Well, and then finally, um, well, so Mises walked his talk. Um, he did not advocate more government um, interventionism to reduce government interventionism. An example in this respect, practical example, would be the EU. Uh, the EU, many libertarians in the United, uh, in, in Europe, uh, see in the European Union a means to crack down on national interventionism. So if you, if you often I'm quite desperate if I, when I talk to my, my uh, certain Spanish colleagues or, or Italian colleagues and say, you praise the glories of the European Union, say, well, finally, these guys are imposing the free market on Spain or, uh, or Italy. So is it, is it a good idea to impose uh, liberty. I don't think this is a good idea because ultimately it's then not based on, on insight but simply on constraint and so it's not really borne out by, uh, by popular opinion. It's, a, it's an attempt to step over the, the feelings, however ill-conceived, of the general population and it, it cannot give a sound basis for liberty in the medium and in the long run. Right? So uh, it's not a good idea to, to advocate such uh, political means to impose uh, the, the ends that are dear to us, liberty in particular. Uh, Mises once said, and we have it on one uh, of uh, the t-shirts that the Mises Institute uh, sells, who is not willing to serve his fellow citizens wants to rule them. Right? I think it's on sale. Uh, non -sale. <laughs> it's another advertisement. Um, and that, but that's precisely his point, right? He did not try to rule his fellow citizens. He tried to serve them uh, by his vocation. He knew that he did, wouldn't get any, any money out of this, his vocation to enlighten the citizens about the fact that uh, it was not necessary, uh, uh, or the, these uh, uh, interventions were not effective in serving them, but did in fact harm them. Um, Mises uh, finally... Um, proudly pursued his uh, vocation outside of the profession of, of economists, uh, so, so the, prof the professional economists, 
Uh, he became a, a public intellectual. Right? And that's also uh, a, a career path that certainly uh, some, some uh, uh, Austrian economists uh, today pursue. Um, for example, Bob Murphy, uh, he is here, well, he is not a uh, university professor, he has been a university professor for some years, uh, so it's not his cup of tea. So he's uh, pursuing uh, another career path that is more close, so he has a profession which does not pre prevent him from pursuing his uh, vocation, which is exactly also what, what Mises did uh, for many years in his life. Right? So when he was active in the Chamber of Commerce, his profession was also teaching a, a course at the university, uh, but especially was pursuing his vocation. So this is something that all of us, whatever our career paths are, can do. Right? It's then a question of moderation, of balancing these different uh, interests that we have. But it is possible, certainly, for everybody to some extent. Uh, last year, I, uh, last year, last week, uh, I've been um, uh, hosted by an old friend of mine in, uh, in Tennessee, and he's uh, he's an avid reader of Mises, uh, the Mises Daily articles and so on. And his expertise is uh, something completely different. It's in fisheries, okay? And he sees how the government is screwing up uh, things as far as fisheries is concerned. Say, so look, I mean, uh, if you love Austrian economics, you love libertarianism, uh, start writing articles about your field of of knowledge, where, where you are an expert and you start writing articles for the Mises Daily series. And say, yeah, that's a great idea. I never thought about it because he was too shy or something, right? But so my point is that he can, because he has gained some knowledge of Austrian economics, an avid reader, right? Hazlitt and, and Mises and Rothbard, uh, and he see, can combine this, can apply this to uh, facts that he has the direct personal experience of. Well, he can pursue the, uh, can be a, vocational libertarian, a vocational Austrian economist. So in that sense, uh, I, uh, I hope that you will retain this uh, from the week that we have spent together, uh, that it's possible to combine the best of, of the two worlds, um, that uh, this requires acquaintance with the things that you are talking about. And it's good to know something about economics. It's also good to know something about concrete things that you only have uh, gained experience about through uh, professional activity and so on. And I certainly hope that all of you, in one way or another, will be at least somewhat a vocational Austrian economist. Thank you. Mm -hmm.